Eric Fleischman is a film producer and entrepreneur. After graduating from USC, Eric began interning for Blumhouse Productions. He eventually worked full-time for them as an executive assistant. He became a producer at EBF Productions. Four years later, he joined Diablo Entertainment and started producing for them. While at Diablo, he produced Carnage Park and Slight, both of which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in the same year. This made him one of the youngest producers to premiere two feature films at the Sundance Film Festival in a single year. He focuses on on micro-budget films, and his bets so far usually pay off. In 2017, he produced Flower, which was acquired by The Orchard. In November 2017, he co-founded and became CEO of Defiant Studios. Eric was in the Forbes 30 Under 30 for 2018 in the Hollywood and Entertainment category. I had Eric on my podcast a little while ago to talk about movies and basically his entire approach to career. And he's skipping a lot of the traditional Hollywood ladder by doing smaller productions. Smaller in quotes, these are still multi-million dollar productions that he's doing. So I wanted to have him on the podcast and here is the best of that conversation with Eric Fleischman. First thing I asked was, how did Eric get two films into Sundance in the same year? You know, when, when I was part of Diablo, the world was make an independent film and then pray to the movie gods that it gets into a film festival. And, you know, Carnage Park and Slight were made for the same budgets, which were each of them was $250,000. And so I think we were amongst the smallest budget movies that were accepted. And I just, I think most people think that those small movies don't get accepted into major festivals like that. So it was surreal because we got accepted. How it works is this. Yeah, someone from the program calls the producer saying, can I talk to the director? And the first time it happened, I was like looking for Mickey Keating and Mickey had directed Carnage Park. I was like, you're looking for Mickey. What's this regarding? Like, we have to talk to Mickey. I was like, uh, okay. And they call Mickey. Mickey calls back. It's like, we got in. I'm like, oh my God. And then the next night, the, someone else calls like, we're looking for J.D. Dillard who directed. So I'm like, you can just tell me. You just tell me. Just tell me what's <laughs> happening. Yeah. <laughs> But it was, you know, it was surreal to have, you know, not only two films, but two very, very, very different films in the festival. You know, Carnage Park is uh, basically a grindhouse thriller and Slight is a grounded sci-fi, you know, action film, as it were. We talked about how he splits his budget. You know, the cast is getting, uh, your, your, if you're $250,000 or below, your, your SAG ultra low budget, meaning your cast is getting $125 a day, which is basically they're working for free. And your crew is working for minimum wage. So you're getting kids who are basically right out of school, right? That's that's sort of just the, the main demo you're getting. You're getting young, hungry, just recently graduated film students who have equipment. And then once you're getting talent who doesn't have to be necessarily the most notable talent in the world, but people who can pull off the movie, and then you're shooting that movie in, you know, 15 days or less. You're not permitting anything. You're not really asking for permission to shoot anywhere. You're stealing most things that you're shooting. And you're trading in all of those all, those uh, favors that you've accumulated over the years for this one movie in the hopes that you don't have to ask for favors again. We talked about how Eric finds his financiers, how he gets his money. The sales team for Ritual was renting space from a landlord on Coanga named Sean, who was an attorney who wanted to get into film. And they were like, like, hey, our landlord wants to get into film finance and production, and we think that you guys would get along. So they introduced Sean and I together. Sean and I got along famously, and he was like, look, you know, I'll give you, I'm really interested in what you're doing. You know, I was 23 at the time, and I had just wrapped production on my fifth feature film. So I was like, mm -hmm. I, I know what I'm doing in this space. You know, the budgets I was working in at that rate was like, you know, $300,000 or so. And he was like, okay, look, I'll give you half of that. I'll give you $150,000 to make a movie. And if you can make a movie with that amount of money, I'll give you more. I was like, done. So I like immediately went back to Insurge because that was my main connection. I was like, do you guys have anything that, that you're not, that maybe you have that you're not making anymore? And they're like, well, you're, you know, the guy who oversaw you over here, Daryl Wheat, has this small film called Recovery that we were going to do that we're not doing anymore. So I, you know, I basically went back to like one of my old bosses. I was like, hey, remember this movie that you had? He's like, yeah. I'm like, how about making it? He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'll produce it for you. And Daryl's like, I don't think Daryl's like 12 years older than I am. Um, he's going to listen to this. Like, I'm not 12 years older. <laughs> and so we made Recovery. That was the sort of the first Diablo movie. We made Recovery for $150,000. Eric talked about the crew. 
To me, in this world, your crew is the most important thing that you can keep consistent. Your crew, the more they work and they work on other jobs, their rates go up. And so if you want to maintain quality or if you want to increase quality, the first place you start is your crew. So if I were to, if you were to say, Eric, let's make a $250,000 movie today, I'd be getting kids who are 18, 19, 21 years old, maybe still in film school, who don't really have the experience that would be dying just to make a movie just to get credit. And the movie would be okay, but it wouldn't be great. And so when you spend more money, again, within reason, I'm not spending millions and millions and millions of dollars, but let's say you're spending and making a movie for $800,000 compared to a 250K film. The difference is insurmountable because you're getting a quality of film. So here's here's the math really, ready? Let's do this. If I can make a $250,000 film look like I spent 1.5, I can make an $800,000 film look like I spent 10 mil. And so I'm hedging my bets and I'm saying, someone's going to see this film and think I spent 10 and they're going to offer me two and that's more than doubling what I made it for. I can't do that on $250,000 because you're getting people, you know, who quite frankly are not as experienced as other crews. The cast you're getting are not going to be anybody that you know at all, which is fine. You don't have to get recognizable cast, but I think it's important to get some people of, you know, familiarity in your in your movie if you can. If you can't, it's totally fine. Eric talked about knowing what people are buying. You have to look at what, what buyers are buying movies for, and it's rare. It's not impossible, but it's rare to get someone to buy a movie for seven figures or above, right? You look at Sundance this year, Assassination Nation sold for 10, which, you know, they profited on, and Searching, which was made by two of my friends, Seven Natalie, it's fantastic movies in theaters right now. Searching, I don't know what it was made for, but knowing them, it was made for less than what they sold it for, and they sold it for mid-seven figures. Um, and it's going out wide this weekend. You know, films like that will break out, and those are the successes. But what you can't do is you can't say to yourself, rightfully, well, you know, Assassination Nation sold for 10, and look who's in that movie, I'm going to make a movie for seven and sell it for 10. It's like, that's a rarity, right? It's more common that someone buys your movie for a mil, a mil and a half on like a good day. If you know what you're doing, you have the right projects and you've studied the marketplace and you're not just coming in being like, well, I'll make a movie and I'm going to just do a movie about this. It's like, why? It's like, because I think I like it. It's like, that's not, you know, you have to educate yourself on what people are buying, what audiences are watching. And that's sort of the hardest part. Then we talked about timing timing is a huge factor of it. Had uh, certain political events not occurred in the past few years, would Get Out have been such a splash? I don't know. My philosophy is, and I hate to say it, but I think I think had Trump not won the presidency, I think La La Land would have been a flop. Just because like people, <laughs> people but if you think about it, not that the movie's not mm-hmm. good, I love the movie, but people needed happy ending movies immediately after that event. You know, it was sort of this very subtle, and again, Get Out, I think Get Out's ending was changed changed and I think they made it so that he survived because there it, there is this need for its timing it's the right creatives getting behind that script and, and realizing what it is so it's it's sort of right time right place right opportunity right amount of money right right everything and then right time of releasing and there's been films that have had part of that come together and then it's maybe a bad time to release that's like a huge thing from that, that that major films suffer from is you know bad release windows when a film gets released and suddenly it's like oh wait we're up against this movie and that was a bad idea or a mediocre film will be released in a great window and it'll make a lot of money because there's nothing else coming out and everyone's going like ugh now everyone thinks that this movie should get made again and it shouldn't it just had a great window of, of opportunity but there was because there's nothing no competition I wanted to know what roles on the crew or in the cast Eric finds most important because when you're an indie filmmaker and the budget is small you only have a few people that you can really splurge on and everyone else is gonna have to work for very low or free I think I think you'd want you'd want your DP you'd want your gaffer it depends what the movie is maybe production designer unless you're shooting unless the locations are like basically come as is and that's all you need an editor you'd want like a phenomenal editor maybe a lead maybe you put more money towards a lead it's really up to you you know I we're luckily at a place where we don't have to make those types of decisions and I think it depends on the type of movie if you're doing a genre film then definitely sound design editing your your DP a gaffer and and production design are going to be important or like even I would say even like you know, practical effects if you're doing a drama I would say cast DP maybe casting director because again you need a little bit more of that so it's a, it's an ebb and flow I think of depending on what you're making then Eric talked about trying new genres 
but yeah, for the most part, you know, we're 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 cranking away. We were wrap production on a film called John Henry two months ago with Terry Crews and Ludacris. We're in production phobias now. We have a production going uh, seven weeks from now called Rise that we're very excited about. We're shooting partly here and partly in Africa, and then a few more films that will take us into top of next year. We're busy, and again, like every. I encourage everyone, anyone listening, it's you know, even at this level and this level being still relatively small, you know, we're, we're still making micro budget films. It's important to constantly sort of be pushing yourself and trying new things and trying new genres and experimenting and also uh, refining what, you know, what I consider my formula, you know, what, what make what works and what doesn't work. Because when you get into the type of films that we do, which is, you know, we, we make three, four, five a year, it's super important to keep that, that lineup diverse not only from a filmmaker perspective, but also from a, a content perspective. If you want the full conversation, you want to hear that whole podcast with Eric Fleischman, that's down in the description below. Alex Berman podcast is on Spotify and iTunes. If you liked this video, I'd love if you could share it with a friend. We're trying to grow the subscriber count. And besides leaving a comment, besides leaving a like, I think even more important, if you feel like you need to help this channel out, is sharing this video. And that's simple. You can go to your email or Facebook Messenger or whatever, pop a link to this video, there and say, hey, saw this video recently about indie movie production and thought you'd find value in it. And then leave a little link there. Hit send. Friends are going to watch it. Hopefully they like it too. Thanks for watching the video. I'm Alex Berman.